Hello, everyone. Uh, I am delighted to be here uh, with Catherine Children, who is a uh, independent and distinguished uh, researcher of Oxfordian issues. Um, she is the author of this wonderful book, Shakespeare Suppressed. Watch my hand so you can see the title. Um, as well, as Shakespeare Suppressed, The Uncensored Truth About Shakespeare and His Works. And then she is also uh, the author in the current issue of the Oxfordian, watch the fingers, uh, called The Grand Deception of the First Folio. And uh, that article uh, will constitute the bulk of our talk today. Um, and you can uh, find it on the homepage of the Shakespeare Oxford uh, Fellowship newsletter. Um, uh, uh, Catherine uh, has uh, been a trustee of the Shakespeare Oxford Society, I think. Is that correct? Yes. Uh, 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 before the merger. So let me start with the classic question. How did you get interested in uh, Shakespeare studies? Well, it all started in 10th grade English uh, with Miss Haley. And um, I really respected her. I kind of well, absorbed everything she would say. And she got me interested in reading the classics like that. And anyway, in one of um, her classes, she mentioned that some people think Shakespeare was Marlowe. And that's all she said. She didn't go into it from what I remember. She just had that one uh, phrase and it stuck in my brain. And then uh, several years later, after I graduated uh, college, um, I saw in the TV guide uh, a debate between uh, Charlton Ogburn and um, a, sh a Shakespeare professor, uh, I believe out of Princeton, and about the authorship question. So I thought, ah, you know, that's what Miss Haley said. So <laughs> I, I watched it. And of course, this is William F. Buckley's uh, firing line. And I knew nothing about it. I was a history major at UCLA. So I think I had an idea about evidence and stuff like that. And so um, all I did was watch one man, Charlton Ogburn, just make point after point and interesting uh, facts uh, in the Earl of Oxford's favor. Uh, mm -hmm. And then the Shakespeare professor, English professor, all he could do really for the most part is you know, say, oh yeah, that's, yeah, that's, it's a good detective story. Yeah, 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 blah, blah, blah. I mean, he could just, he couldn't support himself. And of course I thought that was strange. And uh, this is when Ogburn's book had recently come out. Um, it was late in 84, early 85. Well, of course I was electrified and I, uh, I found Ogburn's book and I read it and then I read his parents' book and I just kept going and I wanted to tell everybody about it. To me, I just thought it was the most important thing in the world to get it right yeah. that the Earl yeah. of Oxford was the true Shakespeare. So that's how I got into it. Um, so what was the first thing that struck you as deceptive to uh, pull a word from your um, uh, journal title um, about either the issue or the, the first folio? What, what, as a specific thing, what seemed to be off? Um, well, you know, after reading Ogburn's book, I, I became an Oxfordian right off the bat, but um, it was w later when I saw um, a, a prominent English professor on C-SPAN uh, sort of put down anyone who believes in the yeah. authorship question. I thought, okay, I want to really um, understand what gives him so much um, confidence that his man wrote, wrote the works because there's really, there's nothing. So I, I really want to dive into the Stratford man. Before that, I was really focused on Oxford and his life. Um, but um, when I got into it and I saw that it was the folio primary that there was their primary evidence, right? So that's when I really took a deep dive in the folio and all the evidence, the Stratford man's evidence and everything. And of course, you know, when you just look at the opening pages of the folio, you just see this strange figure, uh, barely human, and <laughs> looking. That's actually, that's, 
Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, it, it's just, um, you know, it, there were other, I, I found other uh, engravings by the engraver Drochel of more human looking faces than that. And then of course, uh, Ben Johnson on the side and his verse said, don't look at this, you know. So right when you open the pages, there's something off, you know. Yeah. And in my opinion, what, what was going on is they wanted to fill in, give, give flesh to the pen name. Um, people before the folio came out, people, some of the contemporary writers believed the folio, that, that uh, William Shakespeare was a pen name, right? So right. they wanted to quash that idea entirely for them and also for the general public. Uh, that's, that's what I think. There was a, a, a point where I was looking at graphical jokes, that is to say, things that made no sense. It was uh, not unlike the Escher upside down staircases, but it was things that were impossible uh, um, uh, to realize in, in real life. And I think almost from the beginning, having seen that, um, that uh, uh, portrait, I thought that was a joke. Um, I thought that was a pictorial joke. You got this guy that's got a slash down here, which means he should have been dead if that had been a knife cut. Um, or it was a mask sitting yeah. on it. And then everything else that simply uh, made no sense. So somewhat behind you, but independently, um, that looks like a weird um, uh, picture. I want to jump back to uh, your really important book, um, uh, Shakespeare Suppressed. Um, tell me about the process of researching it and writing it. It looks like it took a long time. Um, but there's so much in here. Yes. Well, I had at that point been in the authorship for at least 20, 25 years already. Oh. Um, but um, as I said, I took a deep dive into the Stratford man and that, you know, that right off the bat, what I discovered is that there is lifetime evidence and posthumous evidence. I didn't I didn't have that concept in my mind at how prevalent oh, they rely, how much they rely on the posthumous evidence. That's what really got me. Um, and so my chapter on the Stratford man's evidence is very slim. <laughs> 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 um, but but then it kind of went further than that, just that. It's like, well, what were contemporaries saying? And a lot, as the years were going, I would like write little notes and I kept this on the computer and I would actually refer back to those. So all of it was kind of leaning toward, in a way, this book. Mm -hmm. and, but it still took me about seven years. Wow. To, to do this. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, it, I mean, for those who have not, had the pleasure of reading it. It's worth your while. And so let me give a paid commercial, unpaid commercial announcement. Uh, both the book and uh, uh, the Oxfordian are yours. This makes sense. I always get this screwed up. Um, uh, you can get them on Amazon. And if you order today, they'll be there in about uh, two weeks, uh, two days uh, on Amazon. Um, so in your book, Shakespeare Suppressed, is there a smoking gun outside of the fact of Willie being a cipher? But is there one thing that is particularly important to you um, that that makes the case to someone who is joining this discussion for the first time? Well, I think that if they realize that the uh, the evidence is ninety nine percent posthumous, I I think that's very important and also the fact that there are no samples of handwriting for the Stratford man um and it, it it you know once you get rid of the Stratford man it's all open as to who is mm. the great author and then it's so easy to fall into Oxford with all his life parallels and yeah of course I didn't go into Oxford in the book it was just to focus on the Stratford man and how weak the case is and that also I I kind of came to the conclusion that he um I mean, he was involved in the theater and I will never, you know, deny him that, but it's all about financing in my, mm -hmm. what I, what I could find. I mean, the first reference to him at, involved in the theater was 
receiving a payment with two actors. Um, so, he, you know, it was receiving a payment, right, for a play performance. Um, and the first notice of him in London was uh, as a moneylender. He was later, he was trying to rec rec recoup that loss on the loan. It's all so, very interesting, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, and, and in 1595, when he was receiving the payment, I mean, he was in his 30s, early 30s. Mm -hmm. What was he doing before then, you know? <laughs> I mean, with no uh, no evidence of education or anything. Yeah. Um, let's move over to the first folio. I, I think you've written that, um, what, half of the um the plays in the first folio are appearing for the first time or have being printed for the first time am i was my yes. recollection yes it was the greatest event in in english literature i would say um why did someone want to put out the first folio have you speculated on that well um i think i think it was the benevolence of um, Pembroke and Montgomery, the two brother earls, um, to preserve the Shakespeare plays. Hmm. But but they also, I think, had a, another agenda where they wanted to throw the authorship onto, to the Stratford man. And they used Ben Johnson, who I believe knew the Stratford man because he, he, he spoofed him in a few of comedies. Every yeah. man in his humor and every man out of his humor. So, um, you know, that they were, he was part of the cover up and those first 14, 15 pages um, was to do precisely that. Do you, um, why did the incomparable Earls want to throw attention onto uh, Shakespeare, um, uneducated, untraveled guy um, at that particular time? Uh, was there something else going on? Well, um, you know, that is the ultimate question, is why? Why did they put a fake face? I mean, it's one thing to put the pseudonym, right? It's, they could have just left it at the pseudonym, but they didn't yeah. do that. They, yeah. they put a, some, supposedly someone's real face to give you the idea that someone born William Shakespeare um, was the one who, who wrote the works. And um, I, yeah, I do think it was political. Um, it, they didn't mention um, in the opening pages, anywhere, Venus and Adonis, Rape of Acris, and the Sonnets, um, which is a very strange, conspicuous absence. And I think all, all three of those works are connected to the Earl of Southampton. So it, the whole cover up may have involved him. Okay. Um, do you go any further with the Earl of Southampton in terms of what the connection was, or are we not going to? Well, I mean, right the now. last two chapters of Shakespeare Suppressed, yeah. I, I get into that. Right. And, okay. You know, you, as many Oxfordians know, uh, you can read some of the sonnets as um, written, the uh, fair youth sonnets as written to a son, his, his child. And he does laud him in princely terms in many cases. And I, I you know, I, I lay this all out in, in those chapters. So um, it could have involved the succession. That's what it looks like from my point of view. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. And also James was getting older. You know, right. he, he died in 1625. The folio came out um, in late 23. And so that would be another, you know, that would be an issue. Mm -hmm. who, who would succeed? And who would succeed? I, I don't think that James was all that popular um, uh, in his later years. So um, I think that if they, if it got out that the Earl of Oxford <laughs> uh, fathered the Earl of Southampton by Queen Elizabeth, then you're talking about a potential successor if the general public knew about it. So this, this mm -hmm. could have been a reason, uh, you know, I can't prove it. It's just- Right, of course. Yeah. Of course, we can't go back and ask. Um, what kind of research are you doing now it, to the degree that you can reveal it? Um, well, I'm, I'm working on a poem that I think was Oxford's written very young, maybe oh, wow. before he was 10 years old. So mm -hmm. I, I'm looking into something like that. Um, and hopefully in this year's Oxfordian, my, my video, I did a video about Mary Devere, a, 
a newly discovered portrait that may be her. And so that paper I'm hoping is gonna be published this year. Wait, did you and, just say a video associated with a paper? Yeah, I, I for one of the SOF uh, online conferences, I presented a paper huh. um, saying that this particular portrait, um, it's now at a, mu an, a museum, uh, may have been Mary Veer, Oxford's sister. Oh, cool. Oh, so means... yeah, I I go into more detail in the in the paper, of course. And and the and I I came across on a copyright notice in, in your book uh, the uh, 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 chil uh, uh, children Shakespeare portrait. And is this a representation of it? Yeah, that's a close up. Yeah. <laughs> So, right. What can was, you tell us about that? Yeah, that was um, something I discovered in, in the late 90s. It was um, in an auction catalog, as Christie's. And at this point, I had been looking through old catalogs to. This is actually uh, it. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, that's the. Okay, point. sorry to interrupt. So, um, a catalog? Yeah, I, I, I came to the idea, um, actually it was Charlton, uh, Darren Charlton, um, who said, you know, maybe there could be other portraits of Oxford. And so that kind of stuck. And so I, I had access to some of these auction catalogs and I started looking through them. And so wow. whenever a new one came out, I would see it, you know, I'd take a look. And sure enough, um, I, I, I went through a catalog and I found this one, but actually, um, it had been so, it, it, the auction already took place. So oh I saw God. it after the fact. And then I looked into it a little further and discovered that the picture had been withdrawn before the auction. And so I made a private offer and eventually it took a year or so um, it was accepted. Oh. So that's how I got it. Yeah. Was, was the uh, picture resident in England at the time it was put up and then withdrawn? Yes, it was owned by Lord Thurso, and he had died um, before the auction. So everything, all the assets were frozen, evidently. Uh, and um, so anyway, I did research on Lord Thurso, and you can make a trail backward to Oxford's granddaughter. Is that right? So it's possible that it went that way. Again, I can't prove yeah. this. But, yeah. um, but uh, what... I can show is that the hat that he's wearing, the black hat, he has a gold and pearl buttons. And okay. I don't know if it can show in the, in the, in the uh, picture, but anyway, um, I found out just by accident that Queen Elizabeth had given Oxford a hat of the same description. So black this, hat. this is the picture. Right. Are we seeing? I don't uh, think. Yeah, I don't think you're going to see it okay. from there. But but they, uh, you might see it on the uh, faintly on the cover. No, maybe not. Yeah, you can see one of them right next to the feather. Oh, uh, is it this? Is it right right next to the ear? Is no, right? next next no. to the the feather further up. Uh, ah, okay, okay. I've got. Yeah, it's it's in, a little hard in, to tell. In here. All right. Yeah, right in there. And when was this about? What it, was, it was July of 1581. So it was shortly after he was released from the tower, you know, mm -hmm. when he was thrown in the tower. Yeah. And Abazor and their baby. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, um, I think to f that's about as a smoking gun to me that you can get. And, and how wouldn't he want to commemorate this gift in a painting? I don't know. Possibly. Too bad we can't ask him. I know. Uh, um, okay, this has been great. Um, I, I really admire all the uh, uh, the uh, research and, and, and recording that you've done on this. Uh, I, I bought the book years ago, um, and in preparation for this interview, was happy to go through it and find my markings from from uh, days gone by, and uh, now to talk with you now, it's, it's a real, uh, it's a real pleasure. It's one of the nice things about doing interviews. So, um, so if you discover any more pictures, you can break the story here, 
And um, okay. otherwise, we. Uh, I'll look forward to. Well, uh, I think I think I did discover another one. It was in the newsletter, SOF newsletter. Uh huh. Oh, uh, where cool. I. Where, where I think it's Oxford in front of Cambridge University. Oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Um, right. I'll look it up and see if we can't get it, get a picture of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. Listen, thank you so much for your time and uh, for all of your work. It's, it really helps the cause and uh, look forward to talking to you soon. Thank you so much, Bob. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.